Smith Island Cake. These eight layers of delicious sponge cake and chocolate glaze are a tradition of the eastern shore of Maryland. In fact, as of 2008, Smith Island Cake is the official dessert of the state of Maryland. The cakes are a tradition, born on Smith, a small island right in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay. Dana Evans and her daughter Stephanie have brought the tradition off of the island and to the mainland in Salisbury. Um, we opened up our bakery 14 years ago. My mom and I, we moved up from Smith Island and I uh, thought it was an interesting thing to get into and here we are 14 years later. She learned to make it from my grandmother and then uh, just made it the whole time I grew up. So I would say it was passed down from her mom and maybe grandmother as well. And Smith Island is made up of three different islands, um, Yule, Rhodes Point, and Tylerton. I lived on Yule growing up and I loved going down to Tylerton, playing with my cousin, uh, going to stay down to my grandmother's house. I, I do miss it being, you know, being over there. People are close on Smith Island, so close that they've even developed their own form of talking. We talk backwards. The Call it talking backwards. They uh, they do backward talk. You saw a nice car, you'd say something like, "That's an ugly car," you know, and that means that car's like really nice looking. But... Uh, now, on the other hand, if they said, "You know, she ain't ugly none," that might mean uh, she's kind of ugly. They say it's a, it's the Queen's English or what is actually a proper English. Uh, uh, we use a lot of ain't got nos and uh, example of. Uh, a couple of the words, um, asparagus, aspogras, and you know, uh, or sheena heading it, and sheena heading it means that she's going really fast. Some of these words they probably made up 10 years ago. Others, man, you'll find them in dictionaries from the 1300s, so it's a mix. The islanders have some other quirks that people from the mainland may discover if they come over. We, we go to a Valentine's Day gathering when we'd been there a few months in the basement of the church and we're sitting there and we're talking about love and all this stuff and at one point they present my wife and I with a pair of toothbrushes that are anatomically correct. They said, well, we are having so much fun thinking about you two long, tall, skinny people just laying up there in your bedroom going at it like two pairs of oyster tongs making love. My wife is sinking through the floor and it was like, what? You you know, so they can be pretty salty in their humor. Well, the Eastern Shore, if you, especially in Virginia, is a, a lot like Smith Island. It's like, if you drive down to Eastern Shore, Virginia, it's like lost in time or, you know, 30 years behind. And that's kind of like how Smith Island is, except you can't, you can't just get out of, you can't drive out of Smith Island. But. It doesn't have any, like a Walmart or a movie theater. Um, there's no police station over there. Um, there are cars over there. You will not see stoplights over there, only some stop signs. A lot of people use golf carts for transportation, bikes, or even just walking. It's very peaceful um, and definitely very unique. Growing up over there, it is the place, perfect place to be a child. Going down to my grandmother's house, we would use little like uh, jars and put some bread in it and go catch minnows, but we called it minnowing. There was minnowing, definitely. You'd take the jar and put the piece of bread in there and put a shell on top of it. That was always fun. We uh, would towed boats and when the tide would rise and come in the yard, we'd make little wooden boats and pull them on strings. Everybody knew you, it, there was safety, uh, there was lots of eight layer chocolate cake. We wouldn't let the kids have a lot of dessert, but they knew where to get it, right down the street. <laughs> 10 different homes would feed them cake anytime they came by. Some people come over here and they don't like it. Some people do, it's quiet. Everybody knows everybody. It's a great place for kids to grow up. We just had so much fun. It was the perfect place to grow up because you didn't have to worry about getting hit by a car. You didn't have to worry about, you know, getting snatched up or kidnapped. Everybody knew everybody. Uh, with the exception of the water, you don't have to worry about, you know, a lot of the other things that's going on in the world. Um, you just have to make sure they know how to swim. You didn't have to lock your door at night. And, you, you know, you could go anywhere on the island, run free, and you know, when it was time for dinner, you could hear your mom calling your name from the doorstep, no matter where you were. But uh, it, it's just 
you know, the kids can go out and play. The, it's just a perfect place. It is for me, you know, it's not for everybody, and we understand that, but I love it. Smith Island has become a landmark for historical studies on the Eastern Shore. The NAB Research Center at Salisbury University still keeps old records, photos, and maps of the island. Salisbury University professors also study the island. Environmental studies professor Tom Horton has written a couple books on the subject. The thing that attracted me to write a book is we live in a world where to a large extent, modern humans dominate nature. I mean, uh, when you and I get up to go to work in the morning, it doesn't much matter which way the wind is blowing, whether the tide is high or low, uh, whether there was a frost last night. When you're catching fish and crabs and oysters for a living, all those things matter hugely. The, the very first uh, English records that we have of it date back to John Smith. Now John Smith, the, the, um, the explorer and the, the leader associated with early Jamestown, associated with Pocahontas, um, he has no connection to the name of Smith Island. That comes about much later. The earliest name associated with Smith Island is actually the Russell Islands. But it's actually named for uh, Henry Smith, who was a, an early landholder. He ran cattle out there in the 1600s. And the way that worked then was the Maryland government uh, wanted, that was under the control of the, the Calvert family, they wanted to get as much land into the hands of private owners as possible because that would enable them to collect a tax on the land. It would make the land productive. Henry Smith did that. Okay, it was about a thousand acres that he patented on what we now know as Smith Island. And the, the interesting thing that I think um, comes into play historically is that the first settlers of, of Smith Island had probably no interest in seafood. Might have sold small lots of additional fish or oysters or crabs, but there was nothing like a seafood industry until many years later. Um, they occupied it as farmland, and it would be that way until the middle of the 1800s when we start to see the emergence of a seafood industry and a water culture that we are so familiar with now. Probably population peaked in the 1800s and early 1900s because that was the heyday of bay seafood harvesting, big time oystering, crabbing, fishing, uh, you know, and Smith Island was a center for that. The Methodism, everybody out there is a Methodist, whether they want to be or not, that's the only church out there. And, you know, the Methodism they practiced, just to give an example, would be more reminiscent of a century or two ago than modern mainland Methodism. I remember after we'd been there about a year, one of the old islanders came up to my wife one day and said, I've got to tell you, before I got to know you, I just thought Catholics were the very devil. And she said, oh, thank, thanks, I think. Uh, you know, but it, it just, uh, when it's a place that small, a lot of things that seem to matter big time on the mainland don't seem to matter. Uh, you get along because you kind of have to get along. But where does Smith Island cake fit into this? How did the tradition begin? We found that just like some of the recipes, the history of the cake remains a secret. Not just an Eastern Shore thing, it's the official dessert of Maryland, right? I don't know when it first originated. We've heard a lot of different stories, uh, you know, and I've had a lot of different questions asked about it. Some would even say, uh, why is it 12 layers? Is it after the disciples, you know, from the Bible? And I'm like, um, where you got that from? I think it grew just from a competitive thing. You know, someone made a cake with an extra layer. Someone else made one to top that. Uh, and so they went on up in layers. Someone found, I believe it was an old newspaper ad for a type of oven that was very low temperature. So the only way to cook a cake in that would be to use just a little bit of batter. And the oven would warm up enough that it could cook a very thin layer. And the men used to go away and work for months at a time. They would leave like in October, not get home till Christmas. 
and uh, their wives would send all this food with them and they'd send these cakes and if they were real thick or whatever, they just didn't last so they started making thinner layers. You hear some people say, oh, it started to Tangier, but, and it may have, but uh, as long as I can remember, there's always been a Smith Island cake. But while Smith Island cake is a huge tourist attraction for the island, in the science world, Smith Island is known for something else. Something that Smith Islanders don't like to talk about. The island is starting to disappear, and people are starting to notice. Water's good. Hey, Chris. Dr. Michael Scott and okay. Dr. Brent Zabrowski are both professors in Salisbury University's yeah. geography department. They study patterns and trends in sea level rise and land elevation all across the eastern shore of Maryland. While theories vary about what is happening on Smith Island, geographers believe that the changes in landmass and elevation are due to two factors, sea level rise and subsidence. The term we prefer to use is actually sea level change, because um, in the sense, uh, what we're dealing with here in the mid-Atlantic and around the world is both a combination of waters rising, but also land sinking. Well, here in the mid-Atlantic region, we're actually, the crust of the earth itself is actually sinking down. Uh, and that's in response to the retreat of the ice sheets that covered North America during the last ice age. Uh, and so in our case, then, we have both the sinking plus the expansion of the ocean itself. But in contrast, if you go to a place like the West Coast, uh, their coast is being actively lifted up by, by volcanic processes. Uh, and so their shorelines are basically rising faster than the water itself. And as a result, the shorelines actually are retreating there. So. Um, just because the water is going up everywhere around the world doesn't mean that each coastline is experiencing what we call a relative sea level rise, that is the sea level relative to your local area. It's important for folks to realize that the melting of the polar ice caps where you see like, you know, you get all those terrible videos of the polar bears and all that kind of stuff, that actually doesn't impact sea level rise because that's all sea ice already. So just like if you have a um, if you have a ice cube and a glass, right, and the ice cubes melt, the, the glass doesn't overflow, right, because the ice cubes are displacing the amount of water that's in the glass already. What we're talking about sea level rise is the, like, Greenland ice sheet. That's an ice cube that isn't yet in the glass, right? And so if, the, if, if we're already full and we melt off the Greenland ice sheet and pour that into the glass, that's where you get the rise. There was actually a um, big push in the pre-war um, to get a lot of the mapping of the coast done. They knew that uh, German U-boats and whatnot would be, you know, a, could be a big problem. See, this is the village of Yule, each of the little dots is a little house. This is, again, a map from uh, 1903. Again, underneath here is the map of essentially what is uh, current day Smith Island. But one of the things that's really interesting is how the overall marsh complex and the width of the rivers uh, that are inside are changing. And now that's all gone. This is the area known as Rhodes Point. Again, Yule was here. And it takes us a good solid few hundred feet to get to the edge of the marsh today. Here's Yule again, where the boat comes in, right down there on the dock. What we're predicting for Yule by 2050 mean sea level looks considerably different. That's right, so we're predicting 2.1 feet, a little bit over two feet in the next 35 years is predicted in terms of rise. And this is at mean sea level. This is not high tide, this is not low tide. Uh, but obviously this is considerably wet and will make a good chunk of the island be uninhabitable. This is part of what they're really worried about in terms of the, the future of the island. Then by 2100, um, current predictions are uh, about five and a half feet of sea level change, at which point the island by then would be uninhabitable. There won't be any anywhere to go sea level. The sea will have claimed it. The islanders are not convinced. What I don't like is that the worldwide community wants to make us the poster child for uh, uh, global uh, change and climate change and global warming. Um, and what you're seeing in, in places like Smith Island um, is that these folks have very strong cognitive dissonance. They um, do not want to admit, and nor do you blame them, that this very special thing that they have is being lost. We are not as damaged as people would think. Uh, we, we do have damage. I mean, I don't want to sound like we didn't, but 
as a true island, what happens is the water and the winds wash over the island and it has places to go. So when that water's coming through, it still may be high and come over the island, but it keeps on going. On the, on the mainland, it beats against it and it has nowhere to go, so it shoves it all up and it does the damages. Um, what we are concerned about, and it's nothing that we can help, is when, they, when you hear a hurricane coming and it has a tidal surge. Anything above a six foot tidal surge, we need to evacuate because there's no guarantee. The surge is what does the damage. It goes up into the bay and then it comes back down and it rushes through and takes out the, it could do damage to us, so. Whether or not sea level rise is affecting the island or not, one thing is for sure. Both islanders and geographers are noticing a change. I think the, the, the range of opinions on the island are as varied as the people that are there. We have an erosion problem. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. We have an erosion problem. I, I get it, and there's definitely erosion happening. You see it everywhere. It used to be, you almost could walk to Tangier when I was a little kid. I mean, it seemed like it was obviously probably a couple miles from being able to do it, but it seemed like you could almost walk down there. And, it, and a lot of those little islands and little beaches have uh, washed away, but. Uh, it, uh, it's a sad thing. It's sad that, uh, that you know, it could all come to an end. The Smith Island's got nowhere to go. That's the problem. There are very few other places exactly like Smith Island, which is why it's so special, um, because it is this island community in the middle of this large estuary. There aren't many of those, right, uh, anywhere on the east coast of the United States. Most of them have been given up to development or from erosion and sea level rise long in the past. So. Um, uh, they are unique. On the one hand, um, you know, we recognize Smith Island is a very unique place. It has a very unique culture. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it's, it's really just a matter of time, unfortunately. The question is, is there any way to stop sea level from rising? Sure, there's a lot of ways that people deal with rising sea level. Um, the key to understanding this is to recognize that there's really no way to actually stop the rise in water. Uh, what you're really trying to do is mitigate the effects of that rising water on, on the coastline, on the shore, on the land. Uh, so uh, commonly people will build things like seawalls, uh, which is really meant to protect the coast. Uh, in other areas, people have elected to raise the land up. Um, there's a number of methods you could take. Uh, to protect the coast, but ultimately uh, you're really just kind of delaying the inevitable uh, unless you just keep building a taller and taller wall. And ultimately that money comes from the taxpayers of Maryland and we have to ask ourselves hard questions about is this the best use of our money? Uh, what is the benefit that Smith Island provides the, the citizens of the state of Maryland who pay taxes? Yeah, they definitely still have time. I don't think anybody's you know, saying they need to move tomorrow. Um, but, you know, little by little, the shoreline gets eroded and eroded even more each year, and um, it gets harder and harder to kind of maintain the utilities and the roads and that kind of situation. So um, I have a feeling what they're going to find is that sooner or later, they're just not going to get much more help from the state. So they're going to need help. They're going to need support from the rest of us who um, are going to be very sympathetic to their plight. Um, how we respond to that probably will begin to be the model of how we're going to deal with all these other coastal communities that are not as vulnerable as Smith Island is yet, but will be in the next several decades, right? So um, we'll have to see. However, no matter what happens to the physical island itself, the culture will hopefully live on through tradition. Tradition is what built the island, and it remains there to this day, and hopefully far into the future. That tradition includes Smith Island cake. I, I think... I think that if people think about a Smith Island cake and then think about, other, as, insofar as they think about it, more than just being something that's really good, right? Really fun to eat. Why are these so darn good? And they actually associate it with some island that was out in the bay, and this is a hundred years from now, and um, there either are no people left uh, on Smith Island or, or a handful, um, and, and it somehow uh, evokes a memory of of the place, or at least an association that there was at one time this small culture that was there, 
I see that as a positive thing. No, I think it's a good thing. It, it gives people a lot of opportunity, you know. I mean, that's where it started from. That's our state deserved. So I think it's good. I just wish we still had one, you know, a cake company over here. So a lot of people say, if it's not made by a Smith Islander, it's not a Smith Island cake, so. I always, when we travel, try to find places that, uh, rather than being built for tourists, that are where, places where people are actually working and going about their lives. I think it is the first time I've been to an island that uh, where people live. And uh, another thing that actually grew us here was just the fact that it was an island and all of the water here and the white people structure their lives around the water. I mean, there, you know, the culture is what people have. Right? You know, culture isn't just the buildings, for example. Now, I'm sure there's some very nice old historic homes there, but the culture doesn't have to die. Um, you know, so I don't think that the end of Smith Island has to mean the end of Smith Island's cultural history. These things can be preserved if people are willing to take the time to move them to someplace safer. Uh, so they're never forgotten, even if the actual place that Smith Island eventually disappears. Well, I think about, um, I grew I grew up in Alabama, and the place where my parents live still. My family has lived there for years and years, and, you know, my ancestors are buried there, and I just feel a lot of roots there. And I think, I, I think about how it would feel to have that place disappear or not be able to go back to it. That would, that would be really tragic. Yeah. If you understand, or even if you start to think about, and then try to understand the history of of where you are, it it adds a dimension to your life. I think it's an authentic place, and I guess that's the best word I can think of to, to talk about the places that we enjoy seeing. Seeing that kind of change over time, and, um, and and looking at how people have shifted the way they work or the way that they live, it adds a dimension to our understanding of what is to be human. And again, that's, that's again very abstract, but um, in, in the end it's one of the reasons we study history. It's, it's one of the fundamental reasons is to, to understand what it is to be human.